Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036 0703 7681198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. So we'll take the next topic now. You'll agree with me that the burden of uh, non-communicable diseases is really getting very high now. And people are coping with lack of real information. And then we're having mismanagement. So we have two physicians today who will take us through that topic. We're going to start with Dr. Mayo Wad Daniel Femi who is a consultant family physician and the head of department for the family medicine department in the Federal Medical Center, BIDA. He has a certificate in diabetic care from International Diabetes Federation and a certificate in leadership management in healthcare. So we'd want to welcome Dr. Mayowa. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I consider it a huge privilege to give this update. So this morning, we are going to give a short presentation updates on that status. This is necessary because the Lord misinformation, information overload, and several myths and superstitious belief about this. And again, because knowledge is fast evolving and changing, it is important that we're able to synthesize the evidence supporting diabetics and mellitus management. But basically our focus will be on the non-pharmacological management as it relates to nutrition, and evidence supporting that. Um, the brief outline, I think it's important to have a brief overview of what diabetes mellitus is. I know we are dealing with a heterogeneous group of people here, but nevertheless, it's important to have a foundational knowledge of what diabetes is, what are the risk factors, and evidence-based approach to non-pharmacological management. Um, next slide. Diabetes basically is a chronic progressive metabolic disorder affecting primarily the metabolism of carbohydrate. And it is characterized by hyperglycemia as a result of absolute insulin deficiency or relative deficiency of insulin. Absolute in the sense when in type one, whereby there's an autoimmune antibody against the beta cell, thereby leading to insufficient production of insulin to meet the metabolic demands of the body. Whereas the type two is where we have, you know, relative deficiency. Insulin is there but it's not able to subserve its function effectively because the receptors are not that sensitive to it. It is important to know that it's one of the largest global health challenge, non-infectious health challenge of the 21st century. It has become a pandemic and is on the rise on a daily basis. Can we move on the next slide? Classification, we have 
type one, which I've mentioned, which is as a result of insufficient production. And type two is as a result of challenge at the receptor sites. And we have what we call gestational diabetes mellitus and other type of diabetics, uh, which we're going to mention. But it's important to know here that the bulk of this challenge is this type two, which is also called the adult onset diabetes mellitus. It constitutes about 87 to 91 percent of the body, global body of diabetics, while the type one constitutes seven to 12 percent, and the other type we have about one to three percent. Next slide. Now type one, just a diagrammatic representation, the eyelid cell, beta cells on the eyelids of longer hands where we have autoimmune destruction of the beta cells leading to insulin deficiency and eventually hyperglycemia. We look at type two, just basic uh, pathophysiology before we get to nutritional management. Okay, type one can further be classified into the immune-mediated diabetics and the non-immune-mediated diabetes mellitus. The non-immune-mediated, there's no autoantibody, but there's insulin deficiency. And that one is also called the idiopathic type one diabetes mellitus. Why the first one, which is the predominance in children is the autoimmune destruction of the beta cells as a result of the body producing antibodies against itself, thereby leading to destruction of these beta cells. So this is common in childhood, and the Ministry of Management is administration of exogenous insulin. And we move on. Um, I've talked about this already, non-responsiveness of the cells to insulin, and the major challenge is the central obesity, where we have pathological adipose tissue leading to apoptotic adipocytes and elaboration of pro-inflammatory adipokines. The leptins, the tissue necrotic factor interleukins and the likes. And this resulting into the receptor not being sensitive to insulin, we have diabetes mellitus and other metabolic derangements, what we call uh, the metabolic syndrome, which predisposes to other cardiovascular risk. Okay, the other type is gestational DM found in pregnant women, usually around the 24th week of gestation. Before pregnancy, usually they are not diabetics, but because of elaboration, of some hormones, placenta hormones, that leads to uh, insulin resistance, resistance at the receptor site. And the challenge with this is that this group of people, they are more likely to develop type two diabetics with time, if appropriate measures are not taken. Okay, the other types is the maturity, Onset diabetic of the young. It is a monogenic disorder causing this impairment of secretory function of the insulin and also a challenge at the receptor. This is common in younger people less than 25 years. And this is as a result of mutation in transcription factors, such as the hepatocyte nuclear factor one and is actually no common also, but not as common as the type one and type two. Then this is the other type we call type 1.5, diabetes mellitus or latent autoimmune diabetics in adults. Usually these people are diagnosed to be type two, but the challenge in this is that as the disease progresses, we discover that beta cells get exhausted and they will need exogenous insulin. 
So it's called type 1.5. This case, there's also an antibody against the beta cells. And over time, it gets burnt out. Okay. Pre-diabetics, um, this happens when the glucose level has not reached the diagnostic value of diabetics, but it's above the normal. And so you will have impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. It is a challenge because at this particular level, they have not been diagnosed by a lot of harm and damages might be occurring in the body system. At the APDS study done several years ago, even at the point of diagnosis, several people have been found to have complication. Retinopathy, that is challenged with the retina, nephropathy in the kidney, and peripheral neuropathy, even before diagnosis. And because of this diabetic, it is important for people that have risk or people above 40 to screen because their glue level may be abnormal but not yet diagnosed. And globally, we have about 373 million people in 2019 with this range. Uh, this is globally, we are beginning to see that low and medium income countries are taking the lead in diabetes. In the 60s and 80s, diabetes is said to be very rare in Africa. It's said to be the Western world disease. But in real time, we're seeing an surge in diabetes mellitus, and the low and medium, middle income countries are taking the, and now have the double deal of non communicable disease and communicable disease here with us. So 231 million people, about 50% of people are undiagnosed, and that is a challenge. Often time, we see people coming with complications, diabetic emergencies, and they have never been diagnosed. So there's high burden of individuals with the disease that are undiagnosed. And damages are going on in their body system. And that is why there's need to create awareness and the need to screen people that may be at risk. Now, diabetes in African countries is on the increase. Like I mentioned earlier, in the 80s, it was uncommon to have people with DM, but the prevalence is rising by the day. And this is linked to changing demographic trends increasing urbanization on healthy diets and Western lifestyle. The current uh, prevalence in Nigeria is about 5.7, though it varies from urban and rural center. We have higher prevalence of 10 to 12% in cities like Port Harcourt, Lagos, and in rural areas, uh, the burden is less. But the average in Nigeria, from the recent uh, data collection is about 5.7%. So what are the risk factors for type one diabetics? One, if there's family history of diabetics, individuals with parent or sibling with type one are more likely to develop type one diabetics. Presence of certain genes such as human leukocyte antigen DL3 and DL4, such people are more likely to develop type 1 diabetes, is higher in incidence in certain geographical uh, region of the world, like the Nordic countries like Norway, Denmark, is higher over there. Exposure to Epstein-Barr virus and other viruses like mom virus, cytomegalovirus. Then dietary factors, short duration of breastfeeding, and early exposure to cow maize and cereals has also been linked to this. The risk factor for type two family history, you have a parent or sibling with type two, your risk is high. Genetics, presence of certain genes, obesity, 
the bigger you are, the bigger the risk. Uh, history of gestational diabetics, abnormal lipids, dyslipidemia, increasing age. And that is why from 35, 40 and above, it's important to screen on healthy eating habits, poor nutrition, in glucose tolerance, high blood cholesterol, sedentary living, lack of physical activity can also predispose to this. Uh, this is just it in diagrams. We have mentioned this. Now, what are the symptoms? One, it is important to know that there may be no symptoms. That's why it's one of the diseases we call the silent killers. It's doing damages in the body, in the brain, in the eye, in the kidney, and in the nervous system. Yet, you may not have symptoms until complication has set in. When you do have symptoms, these are the symptoms, excessive thirst, polydipsia, polyuria, excessive urination, weight loss, fatigue, slow wound healing. Of course, in, uh, there could be recurrent infection, furuncus, um, recurrent abortion in women, uh, big babies, and several other issues. Now, our focus is on these components of non-pharmacological management. Nutrition is the mainstay. But aside from nutrition, there are other issues that must be considered. If we are to prevent diabetics or for us to have a favorable outcome when we do have diabetics, nutrition, physical activity is very important and other lifestyle modifications which should be mentioned here. So the key approach for effective diet management is pharmacological. Now on nutrition. Effective diabetic management requires individualized and personalized nutrition therapy. Because there are several variables we need to consider in instituting nutritional therapy. And that is why one formula does not fit it all. The idea of saying once you have diabetes, you only eat beans and archer is, there's no evidence for that. You need to consider, does this person need to lose weight? You need to consider, are there other metabolic challenges? You need to consider, do we have challenge in controlling at the glucose level? And so it is a collaborative effort and a, a team, a multidisciplinary approach by the healthcare providers and the patient involved to iron out individualized eating patterns to suit the patient preferences. And what are the things to consider? Um, we want to maintain the pleasure of eating and patient preference for food. That is very, very important. I've seen people that I met uh, an elderly man some times ago, and he said, they said, I should not eat this, I should not eat that. So what is the essence of living if I will not eat again? What is life for? <laughs> so, we should not bore people with such a regimented and strict di di uh, dietary recommendation. Every recommendation we give should be based on evidence. Now, in people with weight loss goals, they are overweight or obese, the recommended eating pattern should focus on total energy intake. That is, they should cut down on carbohydrates. They can still take their normal portion of protein, of fats, minerals, but they should cut down on caloric intake, particularly in the evening. So that should be taken into cognizance. Are there other metabolic needs? Now, recommendation on nutrition. There are eating patterns that increase the risk of diabetics, and there are eating patterns that reduce the risk. Eating patterns that increase the risk are patterns that involve consumption of saturated fats, 
cholesterols, food that have high glycemic index, and food with low fibers. Diets that improves or reduces the risk is what we call DASH diet. That is dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. This will be our focus. What is this all about? This approach does reduce salt intake to a minimum to about 2,300 milligrams per DL. And if the fellow is hypertensive, you further reduce it to about 1,500. There must be enough servings, about three to five servings of fruits and vegetables. We recommend that we take unsaturated fatty acids and limit the intake of unsaturated fatty acids. Intake of whole grains, legumes, nuts, and we should encourage vegetarian diets most of the time. Now, what is this glycemic index? Is the value assigned to carbohydrate containing food based on their effect on blood glucose level. We have things like uh, soups, sugary drinks, refined uh, products, and processed foods. Immediately you take it, it's it increases the blood glucose immediately. They have high glycemic index because insulin release is in response to the blood glucose. And so this overwhelms the system. And so these people, people involved in taking soy diet have high risks for diabetes. But we have diet that have low GI foods, glycemic index, whole grain foods legumes and pulses, like beans, soya beans, nuts, all kinds of nuts, fiber-rich fruits and vegetables, herbs, spices have been shown uh, to reduce you know, the likelihood of developing diabetics. The other time we talk about Mediterranean foods. These are food that are indigenous to people around the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in countries like France, like Italy. And we also talk about the Nordic food diet. And these are food indigenous to people, the Nordic, Norway, Denmark area. What is unique about these foods? They take more vegetables and seafoods, spices, herbs. Instead of using unsaturated fat, they take plant-based oil, from canoil oil, oil, olive oil. These oils are better and they have mono unsaturated fats. And evidence have shown that diets like this helps to control uh, blood glucose and helps uh, to prevent, you know, developing diabetics. Okay, we can see food that are high in glycemic index here and those that are low in glycemic index. We are encouraged to take, to avoid or discontinue totally those that are high in glycemic index and take more of those that are low in glycemic index. So fiber intake, food that contain fibers, it's actually been shown that it decreases hemoglobin A1C when we take high fiber containing food and the recommended intake is 14 grams per 1,000 kilocalories. And you can see the sources of some of these foods. Protein intake basically should be about 20%. Okay, fat intake 20% to 25%. It is not the quantity that matters, it is the quality. Cardiovascular health is influenced by the type of fat. We encourage taking injection of unsaturated fats compared to um, saturated fat. Unsaturated fat like um, omega-3, which we find in the fatty fish. So if you're going to take protein, it's better to take fish and uh, poultry, preferably not fried. Um, 
is better. Then sauces, we mentioned Mediterranean eating style and um, fatty fish. Uh, if you need to lose weight, basically what we need to do is to cut down on calories. And we know carbohydrate is the major source of calorie, energy providing food. We need to cut down significantly on that. And uh, weight exercise. Now, weight loss, if you can achieve 5 to 10%, there are people that are over ambitious in losing weight. There was a time I met some, some people that were on ketogenic diets, and they lost so much weight, and you think they are sick. But the challenge is that they could not even sustain it, and that itself could predispose to other disease conditions. So if you can lose 5 to 10% initiate and maintain moderate activity, 30 minutes for most days of the week, about five days of the week, recommended is 150 minutes in a week. Moderate, so so these are some of the physical activities that we can engage in the pain on other medical condition because some are having arthritis, some are hypertensive. So exercise recommendation should be individualized and personalized and based on other comorbid conditions. So what are the benefits of exercise? We see that it reduces the abdominal fats, which is very toxic and also predisposes to diabetics or worsening diabetics. It improves insulin sensitivity at the receptor. It improves glucose metabolism and overall improve the semi control and the quality of life of such individuals. Effects on the on cardiovascular health, it improves blood pressure, cardiorespiratory fitness, and helps to correct uh, dyslipidemia. So types of exercise, aerobic exercise, anaerobic, strengthening exercise, and flexibility exercise all are important in helping control diabetes. Meditation and some yoga decreases in expand their glucose level. It decreases to cholesterol and it helps and improves patient attitude and self-control. It's also been shown that exercise relieves stress, depression, and anxiety. And some of these conditions predisposed to abnormal eating patterns. And so this has been proven to be very effective. When we do exercise, the goal is that we burn about 700 kilocal per week of energy through physical activity. And it, it could be more if our goal is to reduce body weight, is weight loss. If we do strengthening exercise for half of the period of aerobic exercise, it achieves the same goal. There are several considerations in doing exercise. So exercise should be prescribed based on the health condition of the individual and complications the fellow may be having. Special consideration in people with cardiac history, arthritis, and diabetic complication. It's important to be well hydrated before the exercise. Appropriate footwear should be in place, especially when someone has very foreign neuropathy. Appropriate attention for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. It is advocated that when they are doing exercise, they should not do it alone. Somebody should be with them in the event we have a complication or hypoglycemia. Somebody should be there to, to aid, to provide the needed help. And in different conditions, different exercises are recommended. Now, other lifestyle, lifestyle is smoking should be discontinued. Smoking is an independent risk for diabetes. And uh, it's important. Of course, I know this assembly is not likely people as here are smoking. But each time I encounter brethren come for consultation, I usually apologize. I'm not distrusting you, but there are certain questions we must ask at each encounter. One is smoking. Alcohol also is detrimental 
glucose control naturally leads to hypoglycemia and other complications. Then sleep, chronic sleep deprivation, you know, promotes elaboration of counter-regulatory hormones, glucagon, cortisol, ketolamines, some of these hormones, and they promote development of diabetics and other complications, and actually makes it difficult for it to be controlled even when patient and on medication. So appropriate sleep, six to nine hours in a day is important. Stress, stress reducing measures should be put in place. We should learn to delegate. It's important to delegate. It's important to rest when, when you need to rest. It's important to avoid things that frustrate you, you know, avoid situations, you know, that gives you headache. Try to find leisure time and wait to rest. The next slide as we conclude, we have mentioned this, high intake of salt is linked to hypertension and hypertension is a twin brother or twin sister of diabetics when you talk of the metabolic syndrome. Smoking also should be discontinued and alcohol. We mentioned all these. As we conclude, individualized and personalized nutrition therapy is important for effective diabetes management, physical activities of immense benefit, but it should be prescribed. And um, stress management, avoid smoking, sleep well, appropriate nutrition. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Penny. I'm sure we're learning how to take care of this horse that is the battle axe for the Lord. We need to take care of our bodies. They are actually not our own. They were bought with a prize and they were bought to be battle axes for the Lord. So in order for them to serve well, we'll need to take care of them. Thank you, sir. <laughs>